Good afternoon. <laughs> We're going to get started, and I just wanted to uh, say welcome and what a great opportunity it is today to talk about a very important effort that we've been doing in the Army over the past couple of years. I'm Mario Diaz. Uh, I have the honor of being the Deputy Undersecretary of the Army, and I've been the Deputy Undersecretary of the Army now for three years. And as Secretary Wormuth spoke about this morning, we identified about two years ago the recruiting challenges and the significant amount of institutional and strategic effort that we had to put into not only resourcing but outreaching to our local, state, and regional communities to make sure that we're successful in the long term. What we're going to talk about today is an initiative that we started about two years ago and I briefed you on last year called the California Commitment and the success that we've been able to have there and how we want to replicate that particular initiative in di different regions with different approaches bespoke to the areas and the states that we need to have increased presence in the Army to be successful. So a little bit about the California Commitment. You may ask, why California? Obviously, be, if you look at the metrics, and there's, there's uh, some good slides behind that we'll continue to scroll that talk about the importance in terms of why California needs to have an Army presence of which we've been there in the past, but those of you that know uh, the brace realignment and closure, we had some significant uh, events and closures in California that caused us to not be present in the level that we had been in the past, especially in the active component side. We have a significant guard and reserve presence, and they've been great, and they continue to be great in their advocacy for the Army, their partnerships at the state and local level, but we realized that we needed some active duty presence in terms of not just uh, a installation, but our senior leaderships present and focused there. 40 million of our citizens, one in every eight Americans is Californian, so a very significant uh, component of our population base. If you look at Orange County and LA County alone, uh, they were, are larger than 40 particular states just by themselves. So if we're not present there on a level that we need to be recruiting and uh, assessing talent, then we're really missing out. What we felt though is we needed to broaden and just not focus on recruiting. We needed to focus on our initiatives that built relationships with the innovation capital and uh, central hubs, uh, both in central and in Southern California. We need to focus and reconnect with academia. As we know that there's a significant amount of academic institutions that lead the way, both public and private in California. But most importantly, we had to build relationships that were not just transactional. And we had to stop flying over California just to visit our national training center. And we had to make sure that we built relationships with the school boards, with the local mayors, and with the other influencers. So they saw the Army as an opportunity for those that uh, are looking for different ways to serve or were just unaware that the Army had opportunities both in the active Guard and Reserve the civilian sector, as we know, the uh, Corps of Engineers and other aspects of our civilian workforce are significantly uh, under-resourced right now, and we wanted to make sure that they were very well aware that they had opportunities. So it's been very successful over the past two years uh, in California. We've done it on the cheap. We're not going to open up a, a new division there, unfortunately. I see Tim McGuire back there, the old 7th Infantry Division. Uh, I wish we could open up the 7th ID back in California, but we're not going to be able to do that. But what we're going to be able to do is have an increased presence in terms of headquarters uh, capacity. And soon enough, in the near term, we're going to announce an increased uh, footprint that will allow us to have a continual presence in California with an active duty uh, leadership, including a general officer and a staff, that will allow us to build those relationships and maintain those relationships. So a very significant step in the near term. What that has allowed us to do is not be transactional, but build those relationships. And over the past year, year to year, we've seen an active component increase in recruiting, 28% in California on the AC side, 25% in the Guard, and 24% in the Reserve. So a significant improvement just in one year of focused activity in California. We, talk, we talked about why we're doing this in California, but as the Secretary said, there's lots of different initiatives and we need to make sure that we build this all as part of the strategic approach that we're focused on. So what I'm going to do is turn it over to General Hockett and let him talk about 
how we're going to try to replicate this, as we call the Army's front door, which will allow for that relationship to endure and not just have a transactional aspect of how we're trying to look for that next uh, recruit, but how we're building those relationships and how those active uh, duty leaders, both uniform uh, and the professional civilians who are going to build those relationships are going to do that. We're going to talk about doing that across uh, different regions and different states. So I'm going to turn it over to General Hockett and let him talk about different ways that we're doing that. And then followed by General Hockett, Dan Shrimpton, who is a, a key member of our civilian leadership uh, in terms of our personnel side of the house. He's going to talk about different uh, innovative ways that we're going to then try to replicate this uh, in different regions. So I'm going to turn it over to General Hockett. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Fred Hockett. I'm the uh, Deputy Commanding General Support with the Army Recruiting Command. I really appreciate the opportunity to get to talk to you on behalf of the 10,000 recruiters and soldier civilians that we have around the world, uh, representing your Army every single day. So as Mr. Diaz talked about, how do we go about building relationships with the people that are out there when largely what we have a requirement is very transactional. And our recruiters at the tactical level are building relationships with high school principals and guidance counselors or school counselors and others, community leaders. But what we don't have is a large uh, strategic ability to uh, build access at the strategic level. And so just for those of you that aren't aware, Army Recruiting Command is made up of five non-prior service brigades. Our main headquarters is at Fort Knox, and those non-prior service brigades are spread out across the country. We also have a medical recruiting brigade responsible for recruiting medical professionals uh, at the officer uh, ranks primarily. And then we've got the uh, marketing engagement brigade, which is responsible for um, basically working uh, strategic communications. Uh, the big 18-wheelers that you see at events, they work in conjunction with the Army Enterprise Marketing Office and those non-prior service and the Medical Recruiting Brigade to get the word out about what the opportunities in the Army are. Okay, so largely geographically oriented, but also functionally oriented on an overlay. And that causes a little bit of friction, right? Because down here, we're, um, we're focused transactionally and with some relations. And then as we move up, we don't have really the ability to build long-term relationships across a command. So you know a commander comes in, they're in there for two years, and they leave, and pretty much every person's got to then restart the relationships that were built over the past two years. Well, our intent with the... Uh, the elements that Mr. Diaz talked about is one, gaining strategic access to schools, school boards, community leaders at the state and regional level. And we're gonna do that not by um, putting a bunch of military in place. We're gonna have uh, two, uh, I'll call it two parts of the organization, this, uh, this C2 node that uh, Mr. Diaz talked about Half of it is going to be responsible for working data on a regional level to understand what's going on, what we're doing, and being able to really um, do the art and the science together to understand how we should go about recruiting in that area and what the effect that we're trying to drive is. Secondly, the other half is going to be uh, 12 people who are responsible for community outreach across the, the region that we're in. And those are gonna be primarily civilians. So when we talk about continuity, we talk about expertise, you talk about long-term relationships, that is more suited to the civilian workforce than it is the military workforce who are um, working through that. So, so we're, again, rela building relations, using data, gaining strategic access, and this is all going to be uh, in support of the recruiters out in the field rather than being another layer of the chain of command to add additional bureaucracy. We're going to be an extension of the headquarters 
and able to uh, respond quicker when we need to do things. So uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Really appreciate you all coming out today to hear about what we've got going on in Recruiting Command. And uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Shrimpton. Hey, good afternoon. My name's Dan Shrimpton. I'm the, the uh, Army's Director for People Analytics. Uh, but my fun job is the Director of Innovation for the newly created Three Star Command for Recruiting. Fred talked about what we need to do. Our challenge is, is we do not have the tools in place for our recruiters. How our recruiters have approached recruiting hasn't changed for 50 years. And so one of the things that we've decided to do was first stand up an innovation ca capability within Recruiting Command. The purpose of that organization is to always be looking to the future, understanding best practices in, in, in industry, and then testing at a small level different tactics, techniques, capabilities with recruiters, seeing how things work, if it works, you scale. If it doesn't, you throw it out, you move to the next thing. And what we're really focused in on a couple things. One, Mr. Diaz talked about connections, right, and relationships. Our recruiters really go through volume. They basically get these long phone lists, and they start working through the phone lists. We also get some great curated leads through our marketing folks. But those aren't nearly sufficient to, to cover the volume that we need for our recruiters. So the question is, how do you help recruiters with that cold call list? So we've got uh, a, a capability we're testing right now where we're using an ML application to identify high probability young men and women for us to engage with. And then we've got generative AI that's in creating customized talking points focused at the individual level to help each of our recruiters in a very personalized manner go after young folks. Again, it's a completely different tool set that we're putting in, in the hands of our recruiters. We also know that there are other some challenges that we've got with the processing. Rules and some of the challenges we've got in our recruiting process has made, the, made our ability to move kids through the pipeline really slow and bureaucratic. So we've got another uh, test that we're operating where we're gonna reorganize at the station level, give folks some different tools, get them focused, and get folks and look at different ways of operating to the enterprise. And then the third thing we're really focused in on is how do you better leverage data for the, for the enterprise? One of our biggest challenges in the recruiting environment is, is we've got an IT infrastructure that is equated. And I'll just leave it at that. But through the Army data platform, we've got the ability to organize that data in, in a way that can help engage our senior leaders, give them the information that they need to do a better job at directing the mission, understanding what's going on inside the environment, and helping their recruiters in the process of their jobs. And one of the fun things that we're going to be doing with Recruiting Command over the next uh, couple of years is really taking this innovation cell, which was just created, uh, officially stood up with our first folks on the ground about three months ago, is to then give them, the, give them the ability to constantly modernize. As we created Futures Command for the Army, the innovation cell is going to be doing the same thing for the recruiting uh, entity. So I look forward to answering your questions going forward. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thanks, General Hockett. One thing I'll, before we take questions, I just want to highlight, not only uh, do we have to have the innovation and the, and the good ideas, we have to properly resource. And the Secretary addressed how we've been able to resource certain aspects of the Future Soldier Prep course, how we've been able to resource uh, some of the professionalization of our recruiting force. We also have to uh, resource how we're going to do this recruiting in these emerging markets. We are on uh, iteration number three of what we're calling the Total Army Career Fair. I'll add another C to that and call it the College Fair. So the Total Army Career and College Fair. We've done it twice and been very successful in Dallas uh, and in Houston, uh, in areas where we don't have a significant amount of active duty presence, but the population base can generally support it. And we've done it in locations where it's been a great draw. So both where the Rangers play and the Astros play, we've had two days of significant amount of community engagement where we brought the superintendents, uh, local mayors, and all the local Army influencers and brought in a bunch of students and other uh, folks that are interested in opportunities both on the civilian side and the uniform side. And we've been very successful. The next one we're going to do is the 1st and 2nd of November at SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles. And we're going to do it over a two-day period. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to bring in the mayor of LA. We're going to bring in the superintendent of LA uh, Unified School Districts, the second uh, largest district in the country. And we're going to bring in a bunch of students and 
bring in the Army organizations that need to hire those folks. So we're going to look across over the next couple of uh, uh, iterations of where to put this. Um, we do have some great ideas. There's been a lot of advocacy of where you want to do it. I heard today that maybe uh, at the Kansas City Chiefs uh, Stadium, the Missouri delegation wants to have it there. There's a lot of couple, uh, you know, places that we're looking at. And if we resource this properly over the next couple of years, we will maintain that presence that we're trying to, to, to build in areas where we don't have a significant active duty presence. It's one thing to go to Fort Liberty or to go right outside Fort Cavazos where we have a lot of presence already. But to go where we're not and make sure to resource it is a critical way that we're going to get after maintaining that presence, building those relationships. So with that, uh, I, we're open up to questions for either myself, General Hockett, or Dan. Jason LeClaire with uh, SoftTech Solutions. How far along are you all in uh, something like a downloadable application for the phone of, to send it out to your target audience through geofencing or something along those lines? Do you have a platform already in place? So for the recruiter, yes. Uh, we've got a fairly modernized front end. Uh, we've got a whole lot of work to do on the back end. Uh, and so uh, our AIE, which is the uh, our follow-on recruiting system is going to solve that challenge, uh, but the uh, Army Analytics Group did some awesome work all in-house. They took the existing platform that we've got that was PC-based in a period of about four or five months, turned it into an app that they put on, on recruiters' phones. We're also, through Army Marketing, uh, doing a lot of work on modernizing uh, our website that folks from the country uh, can come into and, uh, and one, gain information about the Army, indicate an interest, and then get linked up with a recruiter. I think the key thing about the, that new website is that it, we've turned it primarily from a PC-based model to a phone-based model. And as those of you in the business understand that there's a different way that that information is presented, the way that, um, that you have that interface, and I think that that's critical. So I think that's one way we'll continue to improve that process. Is that right, Tony? All right. Uh, Gil Sanborn, civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army in Northern California. Nice to see you, General, uh, Mr. Secretary. A uh, question for you, Sir Dan, on the analytics and the data that you're analyzing. When you talk to recruiters and when you talk to people in schools, you realize that fundamentally it doesn't matter what the policy is at a high level, it gets to what the veto is among teachers and parents that never let his recruiters have a, a, a good conversation. What are you doing in terms of looking at the dynamics of that environment, essentially the, the people who influence the 91% who don't want to serve, and how to turn that uh, it, with respect to how we approach advertising, how we approach our, our direct contacts, et cetera, because so much of the work is, is data-driven, but the question is, what do we know about that 91% veto vote? Yeah, great question. That's probably the most important thing at the center of our recruiting reform. One of the things I didn't mention is we've created a brand new MOS for recruiting. Uh, and the idea is that that MOS is going to come with it a whole different approach to training and developing our, our young men and women to do that. The asymmetry of information that's out there right now is our challenge. Uh, Fewer and fewer Americans understand the Army, understand what service means, understand what kind of experience they're going to have. So these kids are coming in much more naive than they have. And that's been increasing, and, and, and you're seeing that. So, so data's a piece of it. But how you approach the engagement with a young man or woman and their parents or their other influencers is, is really important. And that's one of the reasons why we created that brand new MOS in order to develop that. The other thing, too, is, is we've got a lot of recruiters that are killing it right now. We've got, we've got recruiters that are putting in 20, 30 contracts, two, three times the number that uh, most of the other recruiters are, are doing. And so the expertise is out there. We've got to do a better job of, of helping to understand what makes them tick 
so that we can then share that with the rest of our recruiting force uh, and, and get the folks up to a higher level of standards. Does that help? At, and Gil, thank you. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the civilian aides to the Secretary of the Army program, they are an incredible multiplier, over 120 of them that really act as uh, distributed talent uh, and community relations. They come to us from various sectors, retired military, business, uh, former um, uh, leaders at the local level, and Gil represents one, but we've got nine of them in California that I work with a lot. I work with all the others across the board. Angie Reith uh, is there, and, and Angie uh, uh, gives us uh, that leadership and continuity of having those civilian aides to the Secretary of the Army who actually have been very successful at helping us gain access to uh, those school boards, uh, those uh, superintendents, as Gil highlighted, and I see Mira back, back there, Myrna back there from Houston, I'm sorry. Um, and critically important, because what we're looking for is not that transactional aspect, we're looking for that trust built so the next time that that superintendent or that school counselor or that grandmother has an interaction with somebody that may be interested in the Army, if that first transaction that they had in relationship was a positive one and they didn't put that hard sell on them, but they said, hey, if you know anybody that may be interested or have some opportunities that they want to maximize, then they will actually connect backwards. And I think that that's critically important. So the CASAs, the other local uh, leaders help us with that. And we have to make sure that that becomes important because we've been successful through uh, other means to, to uh, get into and penetrate uh, those environments, but that soft power of having the, the building relationships is really where we're going to be long-term successful and making sure that we've got those uh, relationships are dependent upon those local leaders. Hello, sir. My name's Miko. Um, I'm with the Army Research Lab. I do congressional uh, relations. And um, I came in as a private. I knew nothing about the Army. I was in the Guard. I was in the Reserve. I went AGR, and I retired as an officer. And lately, when I go out, even when I check into hotels sometimes, and there's a young kid sitting there, and you can tell they don't like their job, I say, have you ever thought of the military? And my question to you is, has it ever been looked at that the delivery of the messaging of coming into the military could be given by a man or a woman who would be more of a father or a mother figure to some students in high school who maybe don't resonate with their parents at home or maybe don't, and somebody who's been, I, I guess I'm talking about retirees or somebody's later in their career who can give them a whole soup to nuts perspective. I mean, you can have a sergeant and a staff sergeant that's great, but they've only gone so far who can play out the whole tape into, and here's where I ended up, and now I got my pension. Their eyes kind of open wide, and I completely agree with what you said. Most of them have no clue what we do in the Army, so thank you for your efforts. For, thank you for the question. I think the, the answer is that we want as many voices as possible telling the story. So a peer or somebody that they can identify with is a significant component of, of our of our marketing and you see that in some of our great commercials or great spots where they show an individual trying to do something uh, and and you know their parents are looking over their shoulder wondering why do you want to do this and they tell the story or, or we also have coaches or other people that try to influence so I think the the long answer is that that we want as many people telling the story about the opportunities that are available and where it resonates, we just don't know, but we know that it was going to resonate with somebody across that spectrum. It's a multi-generational uh, workforce out there. We've got a lot of folks that can tell their stories. I tell my story all the time. Uh, I, I served for 30 years. It was 1983 when I was a, uh, a freshman in high school, and I saw a bunch of buses. I, I grew up in Pasadena, California. I saw a bunch of buses, and I didn't know what was going on. Went home and asked my dad what these buses were because they were parking where the Rose Bowl parade normally parks. And he said, I said, was it a bus driver convention? And, and he said, no, you dummy, it's the Army-Navy game. Uh, and it was 1983, and I'd never had any experience with uh, either Army or the military academy, so I went and researched it in the old-fashioned way, Google in my day, the library, and found uh, an information card, mailed it in, and sent it away, and... 35 years later, they still got me. But there's lots of stories like that, and some people, it, that story resonates with when I tell it, or other times, 
people don't care if I tell it. They want somebody who looks like them, who is going through the same challenges, and maybe can come in and say, this is what I got six months ago when I came in the Army. So multiple ways. And, and Tony Gant, Brigadier General Tony Gant, our, our uh, Chief Marketing Officer in the Army, definitely gets a lot of ideas from different folks, and, and she does a great job in taking those different ideas with the resources we give her to put out that information in various ways. Thank you. Hey, sir, if I could also. Um, one thing that we, uh, we learned over the last year is that the only way to solve this problem is through a whole of army approach. And really, we've been able to, to mobilize the entire army around this, uh, this problem. And I think expanding that circle into the veteran community is going to be incredibly important as we move forward and how we go about doing that. So uh, definitely taking a note and, uh, and we're gonna run with that. Thank you. Uh, Ted Cummings with Armis. Uh, I was at that Army Navy game, so it was fun to see the program on the screen there. We got shellacked. I, I was telling Mike we were behind like 14 nothing in two and a half minutes, but uh, uh, let's put that bad memory behind us. Um, I didn't intend to ask a question, but this conversation has generated one. We're trying to generate propensity. This California initiative has in the bottom there culture and entertainment. To what degree is the Army engaging the culture and entertainment industry, now, not to do propaganda, but to at least give us a fair shot and to portray soldiers in uh, as positive a light as possible? Thank you. So we have uh, the uh, Army Public Affairs, and we have an Army Public Affairs West, and their primary focus is to work with the industry on developing projects to make sure that the information that is presented in production is accurate and that we get a fair shake and, and the right themes and messages that we're trying to reinforce. That always doesn't work out the best way, but we do realize that that's an important aspect. We also have a civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army that has close relationships uh, in inside. Actually, we have a couple of them that work with not only the news industry, but with the entertainment industry, and we think that that's important. My personal belief, though, is that we have to continue to take advantage of not only the, the cultural aspects in terms of entertainment, but in terms of the emerging markets of where we have underrepresentation and try to uh, show that there are opportunities for those uh, underrepresented communities. Uh, and California has a significant amount of underrepresented you know, across the board, whether it's the Hispanic communities, the Asian Pacific Islander communities, uh, other emerging areas where we're trying to uh, have increased representation because it's not commensurate right now with our population. And if we just hit those marks in that population commensurate with their representation, we wouldn't have a recruiting problem. So that's where I think we need to demonstrate that there's opportunities in the, the, op the culture and the um, mindset that we have going forward uh, is critically uh, important about you know, reaching out to those different communities. I think you saw it today if you were there for the opening ceremony uh, on just how broad of a swath of uh, American population that we have that was represented in our army. Good afternoon, Diana Breen with Adobe Federal Systems. My question is, and I'm really excited by what you're doing here, but I'm wondering, I've been to other conferences, I've heard Navy talking about recruiting, Air Force, Marines. Do you all work together, together on this at any point, or is it more of a competition? <laughs> I can take that one. Uh, I'll, you go and I'll clean it up. <laughs> I, I probably won't make a mess of this. Um, so I think we're frenemies in a lot of ways. You know, we, uh, we work together. We visited each other's headquarters to try to get ideas of what's going on. The Navy's standing up a, a future sailor prep course because, you know, they got the idea from us and how we were successful with that. But um, General Pappas this morning during the Garden Reserve breakfast talked about the total Army approach to things, right? And we've got to have total Army policy. Well, here's the interesting piece that not a lot of people talk about with respect to recruiting. I'm a high school principal, and I say, yeah, the Army's been here the last four weeks. Every week, the Army has come in. And what they mean is the West Point recruiter was in four weeks ago. Three weeks ago, the non-prior service recruiters were in. Two weeks ago, the medical recruiters were in. And then the next week, you know, last week, the National Guard was in. 
And so one of the mandates that the DCGs uh, East and West are going to be uh, helping to uh, herd the cats, so to speak, and bring us all together to include, from a, a purple standpoint, a joint forces, uh, try to talk about not committing fratricide and take that 9% and figure out how we can all work together so it doesn't look like, you know, we're, uh, we're not helping each other as best we can, especially at the tactical level, the recruiters are already doing it because they're in a recruiting station and they're talking to each other. Somebody can't join the Marines, they're coming to the Army, somebody can't join the Army, they're going over to the Air Force or the, or the Marines. And so we're helping each other. And we're going to have a mandate to do that at the strategic level as well. So hope that helped. Yeah, good. Not too much cleanup required. So great answer. I, I would say that we also need to work where there's common areas of commonality, especially at the strategic level, with our medical, um, our MEP stations and, and solidifying resourcing and standardization of who is part of those stations to make sure that we've got a, a, a good representation. So uh, it's a purple uh, MEP station to in process and we share those resources and those requirements. There is also a component of that for the advertising that I think is a Department of Defense message and that's fair too. But I would also say that there's the frenemies is a good way to describe it. There has to be some active level of competition. The services are different. The uh, the the components are different. Uh, guard, uh, reserve, active component, and we all should have the opportunity to talk about the different uh, the different uh, benefits of those different types of ways to serve. So I would hope that we don't try to standardize it too much because we think we have a good. Um, uh, uh, product to, to, to sell, uh, and, and I think that we need to continue to be resourced to focus on making sure that we meet our mission. But there are definite areas that we need to have DOD joint level type of resourcing, and I think that we've, we've uh, harmonized those to about the right level. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one more question. Lori Carlson, DLA Energy. Recruitment for the um, servicemen and women, understand it. Do you see a down trend in your civil, civil side servants? And are you addressing that also? Great question, Lori. And, and um, what we don't want to have happen is that we slew all of our attention to the active component enlisted force. Uh, and rightfully so, we've been challenged in that area. We've been successful in the officer recruiting to meet, to meet our requirements through either West Point, OCS, and, and ROTC. What I do worry about is in the next couple of years that we're going to have that same challenge with our civilian workforce. As you know, and as a lot of you who, who have either served uh, in the military, active or, or civilian side, is that the comparative advantage that we used to have in terms of health care, other pay benefits, uh, relocation incentives, uh, other opportunities for education. A lot of our civilian counterparts are matching or are bettering us in those areas. So we have to really be uh, focused on what we can provide and how we recruit and how do we incentivize uh, those particular um, individuals to not only stay with us, but then to join us. Because as I said, it's a multi-general uh, general, generalization workforce, excuse me, and the expectations for the younger generation are a lot different than the ones that kept us, uh, that brought us and kept us in as either military uh, in uniform or as civilians. I think that we've been creative uh, in different ways that we've done so. We've actually allocated some marketing um, focus to target uh, the civilian workforce. You see a little, a little bit with the Navy and their, and their strategic uh, submarine force that uh, they're trying to make sure that they have a civilian population. We have a similar challenge with our um, munitions productions at, at our plants and our, and our depots, and we want to make sure that we incentivize and we recruit in the long term. So yes, that is a concern. That's something that's part of the overall, as General Hockett said, it's a all of Army approach, and we're going to continue to uh, focus on it, look for ways to incentivize, and looking for good ideas on how to make this model work, uh, not just for our uniform individuals, but for our civilian talent. So thanks for the question. I think we get the hook. So I, I just want to say again, thank you very much for the time. This is a dynamic uh, time to be in the Army for our talent acquisition. 
We think we have a lot of good ideas, but we don't have the market cornered on them. We look for feedback, both from those internal to the Army and Department of Defense, and also from industry. Thank you again, and have a great conference. I did this with the Afghan Army, mm -hmm. and I've done it for cyber recruit, cyber companies. So. Yeah. Competing against Where are you them. Looking? Ladies and gentlemen, next at the Warriors Corner, the U.S. Army Cyber Command Theater Information Advantage Detachment in 10 minutes.